So to begin a summary of last week's lecture, which was week three in our six week course, looked at the idea of historical narratives and memory scapes. This was specifically observed and analyzed by the idea of heritage and ancestry and how they are shaped by our sense of community belonging in the present day. After a discussion and outline of this and these ideas, the case study of the Sydney Jewish Museum was used to discuss how ancestral and multi-generational memory affects the historical narratives told within community settings, in effect shaping our sense of community and contemporary heritage identity. In particular, the case study explored the ideas of trauma and historic events like the Holocaust that shape community heritage identity. This week, we will take an in-depth look at post-colonial heritage conservation for communities. An outline of the issues that arise when institutional top-down actors control and direct heritage value. This includes problems in recognizing intangible heritage. This issue will be explained as a vital component in preserving and conserving Indigenous heritage for Indigenous communities. The case study of the Duke and George case will be used as a prime example of the destruction of a sacred Aboriginal Australian heritage site of social significance for Aboriginal communities and their sense of heritage, identity and belonging. The main discussion topics will be how do we identify Indigenous cultural heritage? Looking into the institutional bodies of ICOMOS and UNESCO and the idea of valuing and recognising intangible heritage. Given the complexities of recognising heritage, particularly as it relates to intangible heritage, as well as differing subjective value in multicultural and multi-religious societies, issues of management and conservation require sensitivity and respect for difference. Global community recognition of the value of heritage conservation is vested in international institutions like UNESCO, which were established in order to uphold an outstanding level of preservation and conservation for heritage sites and heritage practices. The creation of the National Heritage Lists was set up in order to provide international status for sites and practices deemed to have an outstanding heritage value. To gain UNESCO recognition under this list and the financial support for conservation and preservation, heritage sites and practices must be considered to have a level of value that can be examined and upheld under specific UNESCO criteria. When these are met, both conservation and preservation work can follow with substantive financial support and should incorporate a mix of traditional knowledge, tools, and techniques combined with contemporary best practice. In Australia, the government instrument derived from the UNESCO guidelines is the Borough Charter. Along with this, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, a framework has been developed for recognizing, managing and conserving national cultural heritage sites and practices exemplifying what and how government and community can value through intangible and tangible heritage. The Borough Charter states that assessing and understanding the cultural importance of a place or practice is key and should be the first step in creating and developing policies for the protection of the heritage value of a tangible and intangible environment or practice. In terms of Indigenous heritage, the Borough Charter and Indigenous Cultural Heritage Management Guidelines affirm that in order for a site to be of cultural significance and have heritage value, it must first have all or any of the following, aesthetic, historic, scientific, social or spiritual value for the past, present or future generations. In addition, in order to ascertain the cultural value of heritage, there needs to be an understanding of the fabric setting, use and associations and meanings of the object, site or thing. However, a number of challenges can occur when assessing cultural heritage value that highlight issues 
such as a lack of understanding and the need for consistent rigor, including inadequate research, as assessments made cannot be relied upon. The heritage significance of a place may not be immediately evident and incomplete assessments will negate the conservation process. Guidelines, principles and practices from ICOMOS and the Borough Charter provide help to overcome these issues and to aid in assessing cultural heritage, to engage with diverse forms of knowledge and cultural perspectives and avoid any basic preconceptions. These considerations and others had a clear impact on the way in which both tangible and intangible heritage has been implemented and ignored for Aboriginal Australian heritage sites and practices. Along with these guiding frameworks, valuing intangible heritage requires something deeper than policies and procedures. It requires that we understand the subjectivity of things. For example, the concept of place, placehood, space and landscape are fluid and subjective and their value is flexible and interpretive. The problem of place and space lacking a universal objectivity is similar to that of value when recognising intangible heritage. Both concepts can be deeply symbolically important to a culture and an individual's sense of heritage and therefore their identity, selfhood and belonging. Our dependency on these practices and things that comprise a placehood and help define ourselves and our stories as a society help to paint a picture of what we recognise as having heritage value, be it tangible, intangible or a mix of both. Therefore, it becomes inherently important to understand what the nature of all of this is in order to recognise our entanglement with objects, including intangible practices within spaces. For many Indigenous communities, ways of thinking about the past do not conceive of it lying behind us, but rather positioned ahead and implicated in the now. Relative to a dynamic universal understanding of ancestral presences and agency in the world. This concept of time lacking a linear focus in the Aboriginal communities as opposed to Western world and rather being in flux and simultaneously in the past, present and future acts outside of the Western epistemic framework. This creates a problem when recognising how heritage, in particular intangible heritage, within Indigenous communities, sites and practices can be considered through the lens of different conceptual frameworks established to recognise heritage value like those derived from UNESCO and the Borough Charter. Furthermore, heritage is often understood as something capable of being lost, safeguarded and salvaged and less frequently subject to a discourse of reconstruction and invention. When analysing the complexities of valuing heritage, when the relationship between tangible and intangible heritage sites and practices are not legally recognised, gives rise to the potential of conflict due to cultural value being relative and subjectively understood. In particular, this week we'll examine the case of the Duke and George Caves. This is a 46,000 year old heritage site made up of ancient caves in Australia's northwestern Pilbara region that is sacred to the Putukunti Kumara and Pinkura people who understood the caves to have tangible and intangible heritage significance for their cultural identity, spirituality and cultural history. This geological site provides a clear example of how heritage can be misunderstood, leaving those who value it mistreated. It also acts as an example of what happens when places that constitute heritage in imaginative and emotive terms are overlooked and mismanaged, especially where there is a lack of legally binding repercussions, as was the case when the caves were purposely destroyed by mining giant Rio Tinto. In this example, the subjective understanding of the cave's value, which, which existed as a site of both tangible and intangible heritage to the local Aboriginal peoples, was not considered important enough by mining company Rio Tinto, resulting in its demolishment. 
This raised a great deal of public debate and highlighted the mistreatment of sites of heritage value for Indigenous people and the more general mistreatment of First Nations people in the broader Australian society. This case highlights how institutional management, conservation and preservation, heritage value can be overridden by vested interests and pitted against other values ascribed to the economic gain, such as Rio Tinto's mining importance to the Western Australian economy. The destruction of the caves was emblematic of an ongoing eradication of Aboriginal heritage and a lack of understanding of their value and significance. When these sites that affirm and cement the identity of Aboriginal people and pay respect to their heritage are lost, it further perpetrates the narrative that mainstream Australia do not respect, protect nor preserve Indigenous cultural identity. The Banjinga people from the Poolabar region stated in a letter that the community felt angry, hurt and saddened by the injustice. Rio Tinto clearly ignored the ethical and moral obligations to protect significant Indigenous cultural heritage as identified in the Bara Charter and ignored that what the Bara Charter sets out in its issues. This occurred even though they identified the fact that the company was actually conscious of the heritage value of the site much earlier than they had realised, yet they still went ahead with its demolishment. Rio Tinto chose to dismiss both the tangible and intangible cultural heritage value of the site, as in the Borough Charter guidelines. However, the company retained bureaucratic and legal advantages through their connection to the Western Australian government, which allowed the continuation of the project. This was possibly due to the financial benefits such mining companies bring to the Australian economy and their, and their close alignment this has with the current government of its neoliberal ideology. Though this case was seen, what can be acknowledged is that the relying on the expectation of adherence to the guidelines of the Barra Charter is not significant protection for preserving Indigenous cultural heritage sites. The question of the reinvention of heritage lost and its reimagination being directed through a prism of epistemic cultural frameworks like UNESCO and the Barra Charter poses the problem, how can Indigenous communities whose conception of heritage, time, memory and belonging to place be retained and reimagined when sites like the Duke and George Caves are destroyed? The UNESCO framework Excel itself is also problematic because only member states can prioritise and nominate to the World Heritage List their recipients, leading to politicisation and resulting in the vulnerability of cultural groups who understand heritage value in different ways due to their moral, ethical and cultural actions and beliefs. As Silberman states, the process of utilising heritage as an expression of collective identity has its limits within the framework of the UNESCO conventions that serve as global models for heritage practice. This is a failure of the egalitarian mission of the United Nations and UNESCO that acts as a panoptic force of moral and cultural dissemination. The selective and participatory process of signing on to the UNESCO Intangible Heritage Cons Convention is also political and Australia has been slow to join. Its reluctance to do so, a backdrop to the destruction of the Duke and George Caves. However, by utilising a participatory model of community engagement that places agency into the hands of communities to make their own meaning of heritage in relation with top-down actors helps to negate some of the issues stated above. Furthermore, incorporating Indigenous pedagogies within the existing museum and heritage framework is a strategic attempt to decolonize and progress the social understanding of intangible heritage within Australia and the world at large. For example, 
Clark and Waterton, two theorists, have hypothesized that the use of signage in heritage sites like Uluru National Park have successfully engaged visitors in alternative understandings of the landscape, facilitating a post-colonial narrative. This differs specifically from traditional didactic signage by enabling a new personification with audience members and connecting them to an indigenous narrative of the natural environment. Through post-colonial techniques like this and through visitor personification with indigenous and um, non-traditional relationships with land, more non-indigenous people can emphasize and understand the value of cultural heritage and its involvement and support to assist in the long-term protection of heritage sites. In summation, methods like this that engage in the esoteric, emotional and effective aspects of heritage and that enable cultural sensitivity by incorporating traditional indigenous conservation can play a significant role in preserving indigenous cultural sites with heritage value. What is evident in this case is that the relationship between tangible and intangible heritage is fragile. Without legally recognized official status by a government or institutional body like UNESCO, heritage sites and practices are open to being destroyed and removed from the cultural landscape. However, this example shows there is an increasing social recognition of indigenous connection to the land and a growing generalized post-colonial awareness in society. The social pressure on Rio Tinto resulted in their CEO stepping down in 2002 and the chairman of Rio Tinto resigning in 2021. Rio Tinto's public apology and acknowledgement that the company was aware of the site's heritage value and the indication that two French and British leaders with no connection or understanding of Aboriginal history or heritage oversaw the destruction of the site could be viewed as an extension of colonialism. To counter this, Rio Tinto have employed a contingency plan for 2021 to earn back the trust that has been lost and to re-establish their leadership in communities and their social performance and to review, launch and implement new heritage awareness practices. This appears an optimistic outcome and a great improvement and an overdue opportunity for Rio Tinto to take responsibility for their actions. However, it should be remembered that a heritage body was employed to assess the cave's value to begin with and it raises questions of whether it was just a tokenistic act given the destruction of the caves still went ahead. To conclude, within heritage conservation, valuing both tangible and intangible heritage can play an integral role in advancing practices and reshaping curatorial methods to further decolonize and retell revisionist narratives, calling for further historiographic explanations on colonial displays. The idea of value in heritage conservation is directly linked to how decisions are made and what is deemed as having value and what gains aesthetic, historic, heritage or social significance and the cultural significance of tangible or intangible cultural heritage. Recognition of intangible heritage must therefore face an institutional decolonization and recognize how marginalized communities such as First Nations peoples, cultural capital and historic and cultural positioning has been very different to that of the traditional cultural displays of knowledge in public museums and cultural heritage sites. The colonially acquired collections of many museums and heritage sites in many ways have held no tangible or intangible significance nor represent or are recognizable to various marginalized communities who live within multiracial, multi socioeconomic societies. A central reason for historically underrepresented communities to not visit sites of institutional knowledge is due to them having no prior cultural nor aesthetic understanding of the knowledge systems presented by the site. Primarily, this is a problem of cultural capital, 
explicit and implicit codes of conduct and social norms and values that are not shared between the site and their target underrepresented visitor. This was actively felt by the Putakunti Kumara and Pinkura people who suggested that Rio Tinto misled them into believing their intentions were otherwise. Yet, the public shaming of the company was also in effect, in part, a result of the plea of new museology to recognise marginalised and diasporic communities. The backlash of the destruction of the caves in the media and public shows a shift in the cultural climate of post-colonialism. Furthermore, Rio Tinto's public shaming apology and the resignations of both their chair and director is also a result of panoptic power, which effectively pressured the government to change its approach to sites of Indigenous heritage, including ones that are recognised for their emotive and effective aspects. This case will effectively change how Rio Tinto will manage sites in the future in order to avoid any further political and potential shaming debate and protest. As a result of this, the panoptic power of the public should send a message to other corporate bodies and Australian government actors, including international actors, to incentivize and act responsibly and respectively to First Nations people's sites of heritage value. This newly acquired increasing post-colonial ideology and hegemony highlights how corporate bodies can be treated in the public sphere if they do not adhere to the expectations of the time. Furthermore, this growing awareness and sensitivity highlights an appreciation and acknowledgement of the emotive and effective value intangible heritage holds and recognises these qualities with their importance that they deserve. So to conclude, this week should have given you a good understanding of the issues in conserving and preserving community heritage, particularly by using the case of the Duke and George Caves. This should have given an understanding of the problems and issues when Western institutional actors using Western frameworks and models of recognizing heritage value are enacted and wrongfully understood through indigenous cultural landscapes. Next week, we will be looking at a quite different topic, which will be understanding the research and contemporary frameworks of looking at well being as a concept of cultural heritage, in particular using cultural heritage practices within community settings to raise community happiness, understood through a GDP.